Red Planet. Wolf came to play with Chip. They made a rocket ship out of a bit of pieces. The rocket ship looked quite good. Wolf and Chip played in the rocket ship. They pretended to be spacemen. The rocket is going to take off," said Wolf. Five, four, three, two. Floppy ran up. He wanted to get in the rocket ship with Wolf and Chip. "Go away, Floppy!" called Chip. "The rocket is going to take off." Nadim came to play. He had his computer with him, but he liked the look of the rocket ship. He wanted to play in it too. Just then, it began to rain. There's not room for all of us," said Chip. "Let's go inside and play with Nadim's computer." They played a game on the computer. It was called Red Planet. They had to land the rocket on the planet. Wolf and Chip crashed the rocket. Nadim didn't. He was good at the game. Suddenly, the magic key began to glow. Chip and Wolf pulled Nadim away from the computer and ran into Bib's room. "Come on," called Chip. "It's time for an adventure." The magic took them to a rocket ship. It took Floppy too. The rocket looked as if it was about to take off, but the door was open. Nadim wanted to look inside the rocket. "Come on," he called. Chip didn't want to go inside. "It may not be safe," he said. "Why not?" said Nadim. "This is a magic adventure." They went inside the rocket. There was nobody there. "Look at this computer," said Nadim. Floppy jumped up and put his paw on a button. Five. Four, three, two, one. The rocket began to take off. Up it went and out into space. Oh no! said Chip. I don't know where we are going. They began to float about inside the rocket. Nadim found some boots. He put them on. We must put these boots on, he said. They will keep us down on the floor. They went to the window and looked out. They saw a big red planet. We are going to land on that planet," said Nadim. "We will soon be there." Nadim made the rocket land. "I wouldn't like to do that again," he said. "It's a good job Nadim knows about computers," thought Wolf. I wouldn't like to crash here. There was red dust all over the planet. There were red rocks and red mountains. Floppy didn't like the look of it. He began to bark and bark. There are no trees, he thought. They wanted to go outside and look at the planet. They found a space buggy. They looked in the space buggy and found some spacesuits. Let's put these spacesuits on," said Wolf. "Then we can go outside. Do you think it will be safe outside?" asked Chip. "I don't know," said Wolf. They went out on the planet in the buggy. The buggy bumped over the rocks, and the red dust flew up. "I don't like this," thought Floppy. "I'm not made for space adventures." Suddenly, the ground cracked and a big hole opened up. "Oh, help!" said Chip. Wolf and Nadim, as the buggy fell into the hole, they fell down and down inside the planet. "I don't like this," thought Floppy. "I wanted to go home." They all landed with a bump. The buggy landed with a crash and broke in two. They were inside a big cave. What a place," said Wolf. "Look at it." Chip looked at the buggy. "It's broken," he said. "It's had it." "How will we get back to the rocket?" 
Floppy began to bark. There were some creatures in the cave. They looked like funny little people. Oh no, said Nadim. Look at them. I hope they like us. The creatures looked at the boys. They climbed on the broken buggy and pulled out a spacesuit. One of them turned a tap on Floppy's spacesuit. Floppy's spacesuit began to fill with air. It got bigger and bigger. Then Floppy began to float. Get Floppy! yelled Chip. Don't let him float away! Wolf asked the creatures how to get out of the cave. They told him that there was no way out. They said that they had never been outside. Wolf had a good idea. He took a spacesuit out and he filled it with air. The spacesuit got bigger and bigger. It began to float up and up. Hold on, called Wolf, and don't let go. The spacesuit floated up out of the cave. We can float back to the rocket, said Chip. What a good idea! I hope it won't go pop, thought Floppy. They floated back to the rocket. Wilf let the air out of the spacesuit and it came down to the ground. Good old Wilf, said Nadim. I don't like floating, thought Floppy. They went inside the rocket and it took off. Nadim turned on the computer and looked at the screen. We'll soon be home, he said. Just then, the magic key began to glow. That's good, thought Floppy. They won't have to land the rocket. Dogs don't like space adventures. The magic took them back home. I like that adventure, said Wolf. He looked at the little spacesuit. So did I, said Nadim. But I'm glad I didn't have to land that rocket again. Lost in the Jungle The next day was Mom's birthday. Chip had a box of chocolates for her. Keeper had made her a monkey at school. Biff didn't know what to get. Biff asked Anina's mom to help her buy a plant. They went into a big greenhouse. The greenhouse was hot, and it was full of plants. What a lot of plants, said Biff. It's like a jungle in here. I don't know which one to buy. In the end, she found one that she liked. I will get this one for mom, she said. The next day was Mom's birthday, and the children gave her their presents. Mom liked them all. Thank you, she said. What a lovely plant, Biff. Dad had a present for Mom. It was a plant. I didn't know Biff had a plant as well, said Dad. I don't mind a bit, said Mom. Anina came to play with Biff and Chip. This is from my mom, she said. Wilma's mom came round with the plants too. Thank you, said mom. I love plants. It's quite like a jungle in here. The children went to play in Biff's room. Anina looked at the little house. Can we have a magic adventure? She asked. We can if the key glows, said Keeper. Just then, the key did begin to glow. The magic took them into a jungle. The jungle was full of plants. It's wonderful, said Biff. Look at that one. It's ten times bigger than the one I gave mom. They saw a monkey up a tree. It jumped up and down on the branch. That monkey looks cross, said Keeper. I don't think it likes us. It looks like you, said Chip. The monkey was angry with the children. He shook the branch. Then it began to throw things at them. We can't stay here, said Biff. Come on. They ran through the jungle, but suddenly Chip stopped. 
Oh no, he said. Look at this. There was a big snake in the way. We can't go this way, said Chip. Come on. They came to a river. There were alligators asleep on the bank. Don't wake them up, said Keeper. They might get angry. They might like you for dinner, said Biff. Suddenly they fell into a big net. It pulled them up in the air. Oh, help, called Anina. We are in a trap. The children were hanging in the net. The net was a trap to catch animals. Help! Help! called the children. Let us down! called Keeper. A man and a lady came out of the trees. They were explorers. Don't worry! said the lady. We will soon get you down. What are you doing in the jungle? asked the man. Are you lost? Yes, said Biff. I think we are. So are we, said the lady. But then we have been lost for years. She showed them a picture. We are looking for this place, she said. It's called a lost city. Nobody lives there. It's been lost for years and years. The children liked the explorers. They wanted to help them find the lost city. Maybe we can find it today, said Keeper. I don't think so, said the man. We have been looking for years. They came to a rope bridge. Maybe the lost city is over there, said Biff. Let's go and see. They began to cross the bridge. I hope it's safe, said Keeper. They found the boat on the bank of the river. The boat was full of water. The boat was full of water. Oh good, said the explorers. We lost this boat years ago. They got in the boat and paddled up the river. Look at all the alligators, said Chip. I hope it's not their dinner time. They came to a waterfall. The explorer could not stop the boat. The paddle had broken. Look out, he called. We are going to get wet. The boat went through the waterfall. Oh, help, said Nina. I don't like getting wet. Think of the alligators, said Chip. It's better than getting eaten. Behind the waterfall, there were some steps. The steps went up and up for a long way. Nobody could see how far they went. This may be the way to the lost city, said the lady. Come on! As they climbed the steps, some bats flew past them. If this is the way to the city, I can see how he got lost, said Nina. It's a, such a long way up. It's the lost city, shouted the explorers. We have found it at last. The man threw his hat in the air and his wife jumped up and down. I knew we'd find it today, said Keeper. Nobody had been in the city for years. There were plants and trees everywhere. Biff pulled the plants out of a wall. This is like the one I gave mom, she said. They went to a big building and they opened the doors. Oh look, they all gasped. Everything inside the building was made of gold. The floor was gold and the walls were gold. There were some gold steps that went up to a gold throne. What a wonderful place, said Nina. There's a gold everywhere. Keeper sat on the gold throne. A monkey jumped down behind him. Look at me, he said. Look at that monkey behind Keeper, said Biff. Which one is the monkey? asked Chip. Suddenly the key began to glow. It's time to go home, said Chip. Goodbye, said the explorers. Thank you for helping us find the lost city. I wish we had a magic key, said the man. 
The magic took the children home. Biff still had the plant she found in the lost city. I will put it in Mom's jungle, she said. I know where we can get a monkey too. The Broken Roof It was games time at school. The children were outside on the field. Anina ran up to Mrs. May. Come and see something, Mrs. May, she said. Someone had broken the fence down and dumped junk on the field. Wilf was cross. We don't want junk on our field, he said. The field isn't a dump, said Mrs. May. Then Mrs. May saw something in the junk. Do you see this? She asked the children. It's a mango. It gets the water out of the wet clothes. How does it do that? Asked Anina. Mrs. May took the mango into the classroom. She showed the children how it worked. First, she got a big sheet and made it wet. Then, Nadim turned the handle and Biff helped Mrs. May put the sheet through. The water ran out of the sheet and went into a bucket. We don't use mangoes now to get clothes dry, said Mrs. May. What do we use? Mrs. May showed the children a picture of something washing clothes a long time ago. Mrs. May asked the children if they had any old things at home. Some of the children said they had. When Biff and Chip got home from school, they looked at the little house. The house looked very old, said Chip. And so do these little children. Let's take them to school. Keeper didn't want them to take the little house to school. What about the magic? He asked Biff. The magic won't work if we don't take the key, said Biff. Some of the children took old things to school. What a lot of things, said Mrs. May. We can find out all about them and have a display. Mrs. May liked the little house and so did all the children. Biff and Chip didn't say that the house was magic. That was a secret. Wolf was being silly. He climbed on Mrs. May's table and pushed some books over. The books fell on the little house with a crash. Oh no, said Biff. One of the books made the hole in the roof. Wolf was very upset when he saw that the roof was broken. I'm sorry, he said. Perhaps I can get my dad to mend it. Biff and Chip took the house home. Keeper was cross when he saw that it was broken. He had the magic key in his hand. Will the magic still work? He asked. Just then, the key began to glow. A new adventure began. The magic took the children back in time. It took them to their house a long time ago. The house looked new, but the roof was broken. There were three children playing outside, and two men were mending the roof. Didn't our house look nice a long time ago? said Biff. But how did the roof get broken? The children saw Biff, Chip and Keeper, and they ran up to them. Hello, they said. Who are you? I'm Biff, said Biff. This is Chip and this is Keeper. What funny names, said the girl. My name is Victoria. This is Edward and this is Will. What funny clothes you have, said Will. Not as funny as yours, said Keeper. Keeper looked up at the man of the roof. How did the roof get broken? He asked. We don't know, said Edward. It was broken when we woke up. That's funny, said Keeper. A lady came out and called the children. Go inside and wash your hands, she said. 
It's time for tea. Is that your mother? Bill asked. No, said Edward. That's our cook. The children went into the kitchen. The cook looked at Biff, Chip, and Keeper. May they stay to tea? Asked Victoria. They have funny clothes, said Cook. But yes. Biff looked round the kitchen. This is not like our kitchen, she said. Cook looked at Chip's hands. Go and wash your hands, she said. You can't have tea until you do. After tea, Cook made the children wash their hands again. Then she told Edward to take some tea to the workmen. Come and see our rooms, said Edward. The broken roof was in Edward's room. Is it mended yet? He asked. It won't be long now, said the man. Thanks for the tea. The children went into Victoria's room. Victoria had a little room in her bedroom. It was the one Biff had. We keep toys in here, said Victoria. Come and look. Biff, Chip, and Keeper looked at the children's toys. Chip loved rocking horse. I wish we had a horse like this, he said. So do I, said Biff. Victoria took Biff, Chip, and Keeper into the little room. Come and see this, she said. What is it? asked Keeper. Victoria showed them a little house. She told them that her father was making it for them. It will look like this house, she said. We know, said Biff. Edward looked at Chip's watch and Chip looked at Edward's boat. Do you want to swap? asked Edward. Yes, please, said Chip. Then I can take the boat to school to show Mrs. May. Suddenly, the magic key began to glow. It's time to go, said Keeper. But I don't want to. Will you come back? asked Edward. We don't know, said Biff. Maybe. The magic took the children home. They looked at the little house. The broken roof has been mended, said Biff. How did that happen? I don't know, said Chip. Maybe Dad mended it. I think the walkman in the adventure did it, said Keeper. We saw them. I think it was magic, said Biff. I like that adventure best of all, said Biff. I liked those children long ago. I like to go back and see them again. Me too, said Chip. Looking at the boat, maybe I could get my watch back. The Lost Key. Keeper wanted a magic adventure, but the magic key would not glow. It had not glowed for a long time. Maybe it will glow if I keep it with me, he thought. So he put it in his pocket. Mom had to go shopping. She wanted Keeper to go with her. I want to get you some new trainers, she said. So come on. Keeper forgot he had the key in his pocket. On the way to the shops, Mom let Keeper stop and play. He ran to the rocket and the key fell out of his pocket and onto the grass. Look at me, Mom, he called. Keeper looked in his pocket, but the key was not there. Oh no, said Keeper. Where's the key? I can't have lost it, can I? But he had lost the key. Keeper wanted to go and look for the key, but Mom would not let him. It had started to rain and Mom wanted to get home. Ask Biff and Chip to look for it, she said. A man came to cut the grass. He cut it with the mower. 
The mower ran over the magic key with a clang. What was that? said the man. The key had broken the mower. Ah, the man said crossly. Now I shall have to mend the mower. He was so cross that he threw the magic key in a bin. Two boys came to play on the swings. One of the boys looked in the bin and found the key. Look at this old bent key, he said. What shall we do with it? The boy took the key with them. One of them had some string. He tied the key to the string and spun it round and round. Suddenly the string broke and the key flew through the air. It hit a greenhouse with a crash and broke the glass. Oh no, said the boys. Look at my greenhouse, yelled the man. The glass is broken. The boys ran away as fast as they could. Just you come back here, called the man. Keeper had to tell Biff and Chip that he had lost the magic key. I think I lost it by the rocket, he said, but Mom wouldn't let me look for it. Come on, said Chip, we must find it. Wilf and Wilma helped them look for the lost key. Biff asked the man if he had seen it. Yes, said the man. I threw it in that bin, but two boys took it out. The children saw the two boys. They asked them if they had found the key. Yes, said the boys, but we lost it again. We broke a man's greenhouse with it. They saw the man with the greenhouse. We are sorry about the broken glass, said the chip, but could we have the key? Sorry, said the man. I sold the key to the junk shop to help pay for the glass. The children went to the junk shop. They told the lady about the key and asked her if she had it. Sorry, said the lady, I have just sold it. The lady told them who had it. A man came in, she said. He wanted some old keys. She told them that the man had a shop down the street. The children went to the man's shop. In the window, there were pictures and paintings. Why do you think the man wants old keys? asked Will. Wilma looked inside the shop. It was closed and she couldn't see the man. We must get our pocket money, said Biff. We may have to buy the key back. Let's go home then, said Chip. Mom went to the shop with the children. She told the man about the key and how Keeper had lost it. She asked if they could have the key back. Yes, said the man, if you can find it. The man had painted some pictures and had put lots of keys in them. All the keys had been painted. The children looked at the pictures but they couldn't see the magic key. They looked at all the pictures. All the keys look the same, said Biff. Suddenly, Keeper saw a little picture. It had one key in it. Here it is, he said. This is our key. The man told them that they would have to buy the picture. Biff and Chip gave Mom their pocket money, and Mom paid the man. It's a lot to pay for an old key, she said. The children pulled the key from the picture and rubbed off the paint. Then they looked at it. The key has not glowed for a long time, said Biff. Perhaps it has lost its magic. It's been out in the rain, said Wolf. And it's been bent by a moor. It's been through a window, said Chip. And it's been stuck on a painting. It's had a bad time, said Wilma. The children wanted the key to glow. Wilma picked it up. Do you think it will ever glow again? 
she said. Do you think the magic will still work? I don't know, said Biff. I hope so. But the key didn't glow and the magic wouldn't work. Keeper told the key about the adventures he would like to have, but still the magic wouldn't work. The next day, Wolf and Wilma came to the house with Nadim and Anina. The children were sorry about the key. It still wouldn't glow and they were all very sad. How can we make the magic work again? said Wilma. Anina thought of a good idea. Let's remind it of the magic adventures, she said. Maybe that will make it work. But the key still didn't blow. At last, the children gave up. Mom told Biff and Chip it was time for their friends to go home. Cheer up, said Mom. Kipa was sorry about the key. It's all my fault, he said, and he began to cry. Don't cry, Kipa, said Chip. Maybe the magic has just run out. Biff and Chip let Kipa take the key to bed. Kipa looked at it for a long time. At last, he fell asleep. Suddenly, the magic key began to glow. The Willow Pattern Plot Biff and Chip were at a car boot sale. They saw Nadim. Nadim, over here, called Biff. Nadim ran to see them. He had bought something at the sale. It was a blue and white plate. He showed it to Biff and Chip. It's a present for my mom, said Nadim. It's a willow pattern plate. My mom collects them. Why is it called a willow pattern plate? asked Chip. I don't know, said Nadim. But I think the pattern tells a story. I wonder what the story is, said Biff. Mom and Dad looked at Nadim's plate. It's a present for my mom, said Nadim. Biff asked if Nadim could come and play. So Nadim went to play with Biff and Chip. They went up to Biff's bedroom. What shall we play? asked Nadim. I don't know, said Biff. Suddenly the key began to glow. The magic took the children into a new adventure. What's happening? called Nadim. Help! said Biff. Everything is going blue. What a strange place, said Chip. What strange trees. Everything looks blue and white, said Nadim. We are in the land of the willow pattern. They were in a big garden. It had a high wall all round it and blue trees grew everywhere. I can see water said Biff. Is the garden next to the sea? No, it's next to a lake, said Nadim. There's a bridge, said Biff. It's like the one on the plate. I can see a little house down by the water, said Chip. Down by the lake, they saw a girl. She was all alone. She looks unhappy, said Biff. Why is she all alone, and why is she crying? The girl was called Kim Shi. She lived in the little house by the lake. She had a cruel father. He would not let her go out of the garden. Kim loved a boy called Chang. She wanted to marry him, but Chang was too poor. Kim's father wanted her to marry a rich man, but Kim loved Chang. Kim Shi heard Chang calling. Kim Shi, he called. Are you alone? Chang, said Kim. How did you get here? I swam across the lake, said Chang. Nobody saw me. Oh, said Kim. You are cold and wet. It does not matter, said Chang. 
but Kim Shi was afraid. You must go away, she said. My father must not see you here. This garden is like a prison, said Chan. Your father never let you go out. But what can we do? asked Kim. We must run away, said Chan. Then I can marry you. But how can I leave the garden? asked Kim. There are guards everywhere. Don't worry, said Chang. I will think of something. Kim heard the sound of a twig snapping. Someone is watching us, she gasped. Chang jumped to his feet. He held up a stick. Who's there? he called. Then they saw Biff, Chip, and Nadine. Don't be afraid, said Biff. We are friends. We have never seen children like you before, gasped Chang. How did you get into this garden? We didn't mean to listen, said Chip, but we heard what you were saying. We know you want to run away, said Biff. But how can we? asked Kim. There are guards all round the garden. Nadim had a good idea. He told them what it was. It's a brilliant idea, said Chip. I'm sure it will work, said Biff. But what if we are caught? asked Chang. Do you have a better idea? asked Biff. No, said Chang. It is our only chance. First, you must hide, said Nadim. Then be ready to run over the bridge, said Chip. Now we must get ready, said Nadine. Kim had a long sash round her waist. Give me your sash, Kim, said Biff. Kim gave Biff her sash. Biff tied Kim's sash to the bridge. There were lemon trees in the garden. Nadine and Chip climbed into one. They picked as many lemons as they could. Then they waited. Kim and Chang hid by the bridge. Biff held on to the end of the sash. I hope Nadim's idea works, she thought. Nadim called from the tree. Willow pattern plot, begin, he said. Chip and Nadim began to shout at the gods. Come and get us, they yelled. We are over here. The gods ran into the garden. They ran towards Kim Shi's little house. Now that the gods were in the garden, Kim Shi and Chang could escape. Someone else ran into the garden. My father is coming, gasped Kim Shi. Kim and Chang began to run, but the gods saw them. Stop them, shouted Kim Shi's father. Nadim and Chip threw the lemons at the gods. Chang and Kim Shi ran over the bridge. The gods chased after them. Biff got ready. I hope Kim's sash is strong, she said. The gods ran onto the bridge. Biff pulled the sash tight. The gods tripped over it. They fell over with a crash. You fools! shouted Kim Shi's father. Chip and Nadine climbed down from the lemon tree. They ran across to find Biff. Kim Shi's father saw them. Catch those children, he yelled. Well done, Biff, said Chip. Kim and Chang have got away. I hope we get away too, said Biff. The magic key was glowing. Hooray! It's time to go, she said. What an adventure, said Chip. Nadine picked up his plate and looked at it. I wonder what happened in the real Willow Pattern story, he said. Submarine Adventure Wolf and Wilma had come to play at Biff and Chip's house. It was Wolf's birthday. Happy birthday, Wolf, said Biff and Chip. They gave him a big card. 
Wolf had a large box. This is my birthday present, he said. Everyone looked inside the box. What is it? asked Chip. It looks like a submarine, said Biff. It's a kind of submarine, said Wolf. It explores the seabed. That's right, said Wilma. It goes to the bottom of the sea. What a brilliant present, said Biff. The submarine looked like a car. It had big windows and it had headlights. Wolf put the headlights on. It's brilliant, said Wolf. Biff looked at the magic key. Suddenly it began to glow. It was time for a new adventure. I wonder where the key will take us, said Wolf. The magic key took the children to the sea, where there were lots of boats. Chip pointed to a yellow submarine. Look at that one, he said. It looks just like Wolf's submarine. The children went to look at the submarine. I wish we could look inside, said Chip. Just then, a hatch began to open and a man looked out. The man peered at them. Hello, he said. I'm Professor Tangle. How do you do, said Wolf. My new crew, said Professor Tangle. You look a bit young. You're not your crew, shouted Wolf. How do you do? Professor Tangle didn't hear properly. He got things muddled up. You know what to do, he said. That's good. Get on board, went on the professor, and tell me your names. I'm Biff, said Biff, and this is Wilma, this is Wilf, and this is Chip. No, it's not a ship, said the professor. It's a diving machine. We know that, said Wilf. We have never been in one, said Wilma. And we are not your new crew. You flew? said Professor Tangle. I didn't see an aeroplane. Now shall we go? Everyone smiled and they all climbed into the submarine. Professor Tangle shut the hatch. There's not much room, said Wilma. No, said Biff. I hope it doesn't leak. Of course you can speak, said the professor. Professor Tangle started the engines. It's time to dive, he said. The submarine went under the water. Glop, 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 it went. Everyone looked out the window. They could see fish everywhere. It's wonderful, said Chip. It's amazing to be under the sea. You can't see? said Professor Tangle. Look out the window then. Come on crew, said Professor Tangle. Time to do some work. Push that button, Biff. Press that handle, Wilf. Pull that lever, Chip. We're not the crew, yelled Biff. Things might go wrong. Sing a song, said Professor Tangle. There's no time for that. There's far too much to do. The submarine began to dive. It went deeper and deeper. Glop, glop, glop. It went. Where are we heading? shouted Chip. Will we dive deep? No, you can't go to sleep, said Professor Tangle. You're the crew. You have to stay awake. We are going to dive deep. This thing scares me, said Wilma. The submarine went deeper and deeper. Glop, glop, glop. It went. Everyone looked at the window. I can't see a shark, said Wilma. It is getting dark, said the professor. The submarine went even deeper. Professor Tangle was excited. It began to get dark. It's getting very dark, said Biff. Put the lights on, professor. The professor pushed the light switch. Bother, the lights don't work, he said. 
Biff looked out the window. Oh no! Help, Professor Tangle! I can see huge rocks. She called. No, I don't need clean socks," said the professor. "Now, where's the fuse?" He began to look for his toolbox. "Look out!" yelled Chip. "We are going to crash!" Professor Tangle pushed the button and he pulled the lever. The submarine didn't crash. It just missed the rocks. "Phew! That was close," said Wilma. There was a cave ahead of them. The submarine was heading for it. Slow down, Professor," called Wolf. "We are heading for a cave in the rocks." "Yes, it was in the box," said the professor. He held up the fuse. "Professor, slow down!" yelled Wolf. "We are going into a cave." "Well, why didn't you say so?" asked Professor Tangle. We'd better slow down. He pulled the lever, and the submarine slowed down just in time. The submarine went into the cave. Professor Tangle put a new fuse in. All the lights came on. The cave shone and sparkled. There were diamonds all over the walls. Diamonds! I'm rich," said the professor. "But you can't get at them." Said Biff. Oh bother! Said Professor Tangle. Suddenly, the walls of the cave began to shake. Rocks and stones fell all around them. We must get out," said the professor. Full speed ahead! Oh no! We aren't going to make it," said Wilma. The submarine got out just in time. Phew! That was close," said Biff. We're sorry you couldn't get the diamonds, Professor," said Chip. Just then, the key began to glow. The magic took them back to Biff's room. That was a good adventure," said Chip. "We must go home for tea," said Wilma. "What's that?" joked Will. "You want to go back to sea?" The motorway. Biff and Chip went to stay with Gran. Gran lived in a little village. Biff and Chip liked staying with Gran. She was good fun. She made Biff and Chip laugh. Gran took Biff and Chip to the shed. She had a surprise for them. Open the door, she said. I've got a surprise for you. What is it? asked Chip. Biff and Chip opened the door and looked inside the shed. They had a big surprise. Oh no! said Biff. There's a dragon in the shed. It's not a real dragon, said Gran. It's a kite. Biff and Chip looked at the kite. It's a Chinese dragon kite," said Gran. "It's wonderful," said Biff. The children wanted to fly the kite. "It's a good day for a picnic," said Gran. "And it's a good day to fly the kite. It's quite windy. Can I fly it first?" asked Biff. Gran found a good place for the picnic. It was near her house. This is a good place to fly the kite," she said. She let Biff fly the kite first. The wind took the kite up in the sky. It went higher and higher. It looks wonderful," said Chip. Suddenly, the wind got stronger. "Don't let go," called Gran. The wind pulled the dragon kite out of Biff's hand. It blew away and landed in a tree. Biff was upset. I couldn't hold on to it, she said. Chip climbed the tree and pulled the kite, but it wouldn't come down. Be careful, said Biff. 
Mind you don't tear it, and mind you don't fall," said Gran. The kite was stuck in the tree. Chip couldn't get it down. In the end, someone got the kite down with a long pole. "Thank you," said Biff and Chip. Biff and Chip went to fly the kite again. Chip saw some wild flowers. "Mind those flowers," he said. Don't step on them. Gran looked upset. What's the matter, Gran? Asked Chip. They wanted to build a motorway. They wanted to put it right here, said Gran. Biff and Chip were upset too. They didn't want a motorway there. We won't be able to have picnics or play in the wood, said Biff. And we won't be able to fly the kite. A woman pointed the wood. Then she pointed the village. This is where the motorway will go. It will go between the wood and the village, she said. Gran was very upset. She looked at the village and she looked at her house. We don't want a motorway here, she said. We must stop it. Gran told people in the village about the motorway. Everyone was upset. We don't want a motorway here. We must stop it, they said. Everyone wanted to stop the motorway. We don't want it here, said Gran. It will spoil our village. It can't be helped, said a man. We can't stop it. People come to Gran's house. They made banners and posters. Gran made a big banner. Biff helped her. The banner said, "Stop the motorway." Chip was good at painting. He made a poster. The poster said, "Save our woodland." The banner looks good, said Biff, and Chip's poster looks good too. Everyone went to a meeting. An important woman was there. The woman pointed to a map. We have to put the motorway here, she said. We don't want the motorway here, said Gran. It will spoil the village. It can't be helped, said the woman. It has to go somewhere. I can't stop it. Soon, big lorries. And bulldozers came to the village. Nobody wanted the motorway. Everyone wanted to stop it. But the bulldozers began to dig. Gran looked at the bulldozers. The motorway will spoil the countryside, she said. Now we won't be able to walk in the woods and go on picnics. The children watched the bulldozers. Biff looked at the wild flowers. Oh no, she said. The bulldozers will dig them up soon. Let's pick some for Gran. Biff and Chip made Gran a cup of tea. They gave her the flowers. We picked these flowers for you, said Chip. The bulldozers will dig them up soon. Gran looked at the flowers. I think these flowers are very rare," she said. "I've never seen them before." She jumped up and ran inside the house. Gran looked in a book. She found a picture of the flowers. "This is wonderful!" shouted Gran. "These flowers are rare. Now we can stop the motorway." People came from everywhere. They looked at the rare flowers. This is amazing, they said. We've never seen these flowers before. They must be saved. Hooray! Shouted Gran. These flowers will stop the motorway. They can't put that motorway here. They can't dig up rare flowers. The rare flowers were saved, and so was Gran's village. The bulldozers and lorries went away.
but they left a big hole in the ground. Thank you for helping us stop the motorway," said Gran. "What will you do about the hole?" asked Biff. Gran smiled. She had an idea. The big hole was made into a lake. Ducks came to live on it, and wildflowers grew round it. The children will like this," said Gran. "It's better than a motorway." The bully. A new girl came to the school. She was in Biff and Chip's class. The new girl was called Rosie, and she didn't look very friendly. She pulled a face at Anina. Rosie sat next to Chip. Chip didn't like her. She took his pens and scribbled on his picture. So Chip scribbled on her picture. Rosie got Chip into trouble. She went to Mrs. May. He scribbled on my picture, she said. Mrs. May was cross with Chip. She told him off. Nobody liked the new girl. She was a bully. She called everyone nasty names. She called Chip a motor mouth, and she called Wolf a parrot face. Rosie was nasty to Biff. She took her crisps and called her a toffee nose. Biff was frightened of Rosie. Everyone was frightened of her. Rosie was nasty to Anina. She called her a goody goody and pulled her hair. Ow! Stop it! Said Anina. Leave me alone. Wilma was bigger than Rosie. So she ran to help Anina, but Rosie was a bully. She called Wilma a dinosaur brain, and she pushed her over. Rosie pulled Chip's ear, and she wouldn't let go. "Tell me a secret," she said. "Go on." Chip didn't want to tell her a secret. "Go on, Motor Mouse," said Rosie. Rosie pulled Chip's ear even harder. Tell me a secret," she said. "Go on." Chip didn't want to, but he told Rosie about the magic key. Rosie wanted to see the magic key, so she made Chip take her home. "Let me see this key," she said. "I want a magic adventure." The children went to Biff's room. Rosie looked at the magic key, but it wouldn't glow. It's just an old key," she said. "It isn't magic at all. The magic key wouldn't glow when Rosie was holding it, but as soon as Chip took the key, it began to glow. It's a trick," said Rosie. The magic key took the children on a new adventure. It took Rosie too. "Help!" called Rosie. "I don't like this. Make it stop." The magic key took the children to a school playground. This is just a playground," said Rosie. "This isn't a magic adventure." "How do you know?" asked Chip. Rosie was cross with Chip. "This is a silly adventure," Motor Mouse said. Rosie, the magic key is silly. The magic key began to glow, but this time it glowed red. The magic turned Rosie into a motor mouse. What's happening? Shouted Rosie. I don't like this. You're a motor mouse, said Nadine. Rosie tried to grab the magic key, but Chip threw it to Wilma. Give the key to me, dinosaur brain! Shouted Rosie. The magic key glowed red again. The key turned Rosie into a dinosaur brain. Help! Shouted Rosie. I don't like this. The children began to laugh. Give me the magic key! Shouted Rosie. Wilma threw the key to Wolf. Rosie tried to grab it. Give me that key, Parrot Face! She shouted. But the key glowed again. The magic key gave Rosie a parrot face. 
The children laughed and laughed. I don't like this, said Rosie. It's not fair. Give me the magic key. Will threw the key to Nadim. Give me that key, shouted Rosie. She tried to grab it, but Nadim threw it to Anina. Rosie got very angry. She tried to hit Wolf, but the key glowed red again. The magic made Rosie hit herself. Ow! She said. That hurts! Rosie began to cry. She wanted the magic adventure to stop. Suddenly, the magic key began to glow. This time, it took the children home. Biff and Chip looked at Rosie, then they looked at the magic key. This key is magic, said Biff, and it doesn't like bullies. Nobody likes bullies. Rosie ran home. The children were glad, but Biff felt a bit sorry for her. That was a strange adventure, said Biff. The magic was different this time. The next day, two big children saw Rosie. The big children were bullies too. They wanted Rosie's sweet. So they pushed her against the wall. Then the bullies pulled Rosie's ear. Help! called Rosie. That hurts! Let me go! she shouted. Chip and Wilma saw the bullies. They didn't know what to do. Wilma had an idea. She ran and told Mrs. May about Rosie and the bullies. Come quickly, Mrs. May, called Wilma. Rosie needs your help. Mrs. May went to help Rosie. She told the bullies off. Nobody likes bullies, said Mrs. May. Bullying is nasty. Don't bully people again. Mrs. May spoke to all the children. Nobody likes bullies, she said. Wilma was right to tell a grown-up. Always tell a grown-up about bullies. We don't want bullies in this school. Rosie was glad that Chip and Wilma had helped her. Thank you, she said. She was sorry she had been a bully, and she didn't bully anyone again. The next day, a new boy came to the school. His name was Sam, and he didn't look very friendly. Oh no, said Chip. The Hunt for Gold Wilma's mom had a charm bracelet. It was made of gold. The bracelet had 10 charms on it. The charms were made of gold too. It's a beautiful bracelet, said Chip. Wilma's mom was washing her hands at the sink. She had the bracelet on. One of the charms fell off the bracelet, and it went down the plug hole. Wilma's mom was very upset. I hope I can get the charm out of the plug hole, she said. Chip ran and got his mom. She can get the charm out, he said. Mom put a plastic ball under the sink. Everyone looked in the bowl. There's a charm, said mom. Yuck, said Wilma. It's got dirt on it. Wilma's mom was glad to get it back. Mom found something else. Yuck, she said. Look what I found. It was Wolf's old chewing gum. What a place to stick old chewing gum, said Wilma's mom. The children went to Bib's bedroom. Wolf had three packets of chewing gum. He gave some gum to Chip. This is my bedroom, said Biff. So mind where you put the old chewing gum. Suddenly, the magic key began to glow. The magic took the children on a new adventure. Help, said Wolf. I don't know what to do with my old chewing gum. The magic took the children back in time. It took them to a river. A boy and a girl were looking for something in the water. The boy and the girl had big pans. They scooped up little stones from the river. 
Then they looked for tiny bits of gold in the bottom of the pans. The boy and girl got angry when they saw the children. They didn't want them to look for gold. This is our bit of river, they shouted. Go and look for gold somewhere else. Wolf gave the boy and girl some gum. They hadn't seen chewing gum before. They didn't know what to do with it. You just chew it, said Wolf. Chew it, but don't swallow it. The boy was called Luke, and the girl was called Alice. They lived in a hut by the river. Alice and Luke looked for gold every day. It was a hard life. The family hadn't found any gold, and Luke and Alice was always hungry. Looking for gold is hard, said Luke. Do you want to help us? The children helped look for gold. Wolf and Biff helped Luke's father. Wilma and Chip helped Alice and Luke. I'm glad I brought the gum, said Wolf. This is hard work. It was cold in the river, and the children soon got tired. We do this every day, said Luke. And we still haven't found any gold. Suddenly, Luke's father shouted, Gold! He yelled, We found gold! He picked up a big nugget of gold and jumped up and down. Everyone ran to see. Everyone looked at the gold nugget. It felt heavy and cold. Hooray! shouted Luke's mother. We have found gold at last, she said. I thought we'd never find any. The children went to town with Luke's mother and father. Luke and Alice were excited. We can sell the gold, they said, and we can buy some food. We can buy new clothes, said Luke's mother, and a new spade, said Luke's father, and some chewing gum, said Luke. What's chewing gum? asked Luke's father. Some men were waiting in the road. Oh no, said Luke's father. Robbers! They will steal our gold nugget. What shall we do? Wilf had an idea. He spoke to all the children. Give me your chewing gum, he said. Give me all the old chewing gum and give me the gold nugget. The robbers wanted gold and money. But we've just a poor family, said Luke's father. We haven't got any money, and we haven't found any gold. The robbers looked everywhere. They searched everyone. We are only children, said Alice. We haven't got any gold, and we haven't got any money. The robbers couldn't find the gold. They let everyone go. Hooray, said Luke. Wolf's chewing gum saved the gold. Is that chewing gum? asked Luke's father. Luke's father and mother got some money for the gold. I can have a new dress, said Alice. And I can have new boots, said Luke. Luke's father bought a new cart. It was bigger than the old one. We need a new cart, said Luke. There is so much to take home. The children helped them put everything on the cart. This is hard work too, said Biff. These magic adventures are not all fun. They all went back to river. The family put on the new clothes. Wilma and Biff looked for gold. I hope we find some, said Wilma. I love to find the gold nugget. Suddenly, Biff saw a little yellow speck in the pan. She had found some gold. It's very small, she said. Just then, the magic key began to glow. The magic took the children home. Biff looked at the gold. It looks really tiny now, she said. It looks like a speck of dust. Suddenly, Chip sneezed. 
The speck of gold blew out of Bib's hand. It blew onto the carpet. Did you see where it went? Asked Biff. Oh no! Sorry," said Chip. The children looked and looked. They couldn't find the little speck of gold. I don't think we ever will," said Biff. "Oh no," said everyone. Chinese adventure. It was Gran's birthday, so she had come to stay. The children gave Gran a present. Happy birthday! They said. Thank you," said Gran. Dad and Mom gave Gran a present. It's a funny shape," said Gran. "I can't think what it can be." The children laughed. "We can," said Keeper. Gran was pleased with the present. It was a Chinese vase. "I hope you like it," said Mom. "It's beautiful," said Gran. "Thank you." Put it in a safe place. Said Dad. Gran had a surprise for everyone. She had a box of fireworks. She wanted a firework party. But I thought fireworks were dangerous," said Biff. "Fireworks are dangerous," said Gran. "So children mustn't play with them." Mom and Gran got the fireworks ready. They were very careful. The children stayed out of the way. Nadim and Anina came to the party. Everyone was excited. Gran let off a big firework. Oh! said everyone. What a beautiful firework! said Chip. Dogs don't like fireworks, so Floppy stayed inside the house. Suddenly, a firework made a loud bang. I don't like this," thought Floppy. So he hid under a little table. It was time to have tea. Mom had a surprise for Gran. She had a birthday cake with lots of candles. "Happy birthday, Gran!" said everyone. Biff went into the front room to get her camera. She saw Gran's vase on the floor. The vase was broken. Oh no," said Biff. The children went to Biff's room. Biff showed them the broken vase. Gran will be upset," said Chip. "And so will Mom and Dad. I hope we can mend it," said Biff. Suddenly, the key began to glow. The magic took the children into a new adventure. Oh no," said Biff. "I wanted to put the vase back downstairs." The magic took the children back in time. It took them to China long ago. Nadim knew where they were. "We are in the Forbidden City," he said. "Why is it called that?" asked Chip. The emperor lives here," said Nadim. "He lives here with his family. Other people are not allowed to come here. That is why it is called the Forbidden City." There was a fierce dog in the Forbidden City. It didn't like Floppy. The fierce dog growled and barked, but Floppy didn't want to fight. "Stop it!" shouted Chip. Some women ran up and grabbed the dogs. The children were worried. "Oh, help!" said Chip. The woman took the children and Floppy to the emperor. "What are you doing in the Forbidden City?" he shouted. "People are not allowed in here." The emperor called his soldiers. "Put them in prison!" he shouted. "That will teach them." To come to the Forbidden City, I think we have upset him," said Biff. The emperor had two children. 
They were twins, and they looked exactly the same. The twins spoke to the emperor. One of them pointed to the children. The twins wanted to play with keeper. I will put you in prison tomorrow," said the emperor. "Today you can play with the twins." "Hooray!" said the twins. The twins had never played with other children. They didn't know how to play football. One of the twins kicked Nadim. "Ow!" said Nadim. "That was my leg." Suddenly the ball rolled away and fell down a granting. Oh no," said the twins. "Now the ball is lost." Both the twins began to cry. Biff and Chip pulled up the grunting. Nadim could see some steps. He began to go down them. "Hurry up," said Biff. "We don't want the emperor to put us in prison." Nadim went into a big cellar. It was full of cobwebs and dust. Nadim called the others. "Look at these giant vases," he said. "They look like Grand's vase." Some people came into the cellar. They were the emperor's servants. They didn't like the emperor. They had barrels of gunpowder because they wanted to blow up the palace. The children were frightened. They hid inside the vases. The people didn't see them. We will come back and blow up the palace tonight," said the man. The children ran to the emperor. They told him about the gunpowder under the palace. Some people wanted to blow up the palace tonight," they said. That night, the people came back. The emperor's soldiers were waiting. The emperor was pleased with the children. "I won't put you in prison now," he said. The emperor had a big firework party. There were lots and lots of fireworks. They lit up the sky. Everyone gasped when the fireworks went off. Biff thought of Gran. I wish she was here. She thought. Gran would love all these fireworks. She'd love this adventure. The emperor wanted to give the children a present. Biff had a good idea. She asked for one of the big vases. Suddenly, the magic key began to glow. The magic took the children home. It took the giant vase too. But now, the vase was quite small. It looks exactly the same as Grand's vase," said Chip. The children looked at the vases. "Oh no," said Biff. "They aren't quite the same after all." The new vase has Chinese writing on it. Do you think Gran will notice? Roman adventure. Biff and Chip were doing a project on the Romans. The project was for Mrs. May. Biff made a chariot and Chip drew a picture. Mom and Dad looked at the project. The Romans are interesting," said Biff. Chip showed Mom his picture. It was a picture of Roman chariot. The chariot was pulled by four horses. Biff showed Dad the model. The Romans had chariot races," said Biff. The races were dangerous. The chariot was so heavy; it needed four horses to pull it. Mom and Dad played the joke on Biff and Chip. They dressed up as Romans. It's time for supper," called Dad. Keeper has some pizza and Mom has some grapes. This is a Roman supper," said Mom. Romans didn't have pizzas," laughed Biff. "How do you know?" asked Mom. Biff and Chip went to Biff's room. Biff wanted to take the chariot to school, but she still had to paint it. Chip was good at painting, so he helped Biff. Suddenly, the magic key began to glow. The magic took Biff and Chip on a new adventure. "Oh no!" said Biff. "I'm still painting the model chariot." 
The magic took the children back to Roman times. It took them to Rome. Biff and Chip saw a girl. She was playing in the street. The girl looked at Biff's model. It's a good model, she said, but it doesn't look quite right. We've never seen a real chariot, said Biff. The Roman girl was called Diana. She had a brother called Mark. He was a chariot driver. Mark looked at Biff's model chariot. I can show you a real chariot, he said. Mark opened some big doors. Inside was a real chariot. It was like Biff's model, but it was very big. Wow, said Biff. Mark let Biff go on the chariot. Biff pretended she was a chariot driver. She pretended she was in a race. I wish I could be a chariot driver, said Biff. Mark laughed at Biff. You have to be strong to race chariot, he said. I'm in a race today. Come and watch it. Everyone was hungry, so Diana took the children home. We can have some bread, she said. My father is a baker. He makes the best bread in Rome. Everyone looked at the bread, but something was wrong. The bread didn't look right. It was flat. It didn't look like bread at all. Diana's father made some more bread. He baked it in the oven, but it was flat too. This is bad, said Diana's father. Nobody will buy bread like this. Chip looked at the flat bread. He had a good idea. We can make pizzas, he said. What are pizzas? Asked Diana. We don't know what pizzas are. Chip told Diana's mother how to make pizzas. Everyone helped. Diana's mother cooked the pizzas in the big oven. The pizzas looked good. I hope you like them, said Chip. Everyone likes pizzas, said Biff. They smell good, said Diana's mother. The pizzas tasted good too. Diana's father was pleased. Now we can sell them, he said. We can sell lots and lots. What a good job! The bread was flat. They went outside to sell the pizzas, but there was nobody in the street. There was nobody to buy the pizzas. Where is everyone? asked Biff. Everyone had gone to the chariot races. Diana's father was upset. He looked at the pizzas. All that work for nothing, he said. How can we sell pizzas when everyone is at the chariot races? Diana had an idea. She put some pizzas in a basket. Come on, she called. If everyone is at the chariot races, we can sell the pizzas there. They took the pizzas to the chariot races. Come and buy a pizza, called Diana. But nobody bought the pizzas. Everyone was looking at the races. The children saw Mark, so they gave him one of the pizzas. These pizzas are good, said Mark. Biff looked at the chariot, and she had a good idea. The children had a banner. It was about the pizzas. Mark put it on his chariot. The people laughed when they saw the banner. Why has Mark put the banner on his chariot? People asked. And what are pizzas? The race began, and everyone cheered when Mark came first. The people ran to buy the pizzas. These pizzas are good, they said. What a good idea! Put a banner on a chariot. Just then. Some soldiers grabbed the family and the children. You must stop selling pizzas, they said. The emperor wanted to see you. Come with us. The emperor was angry. This has got to stop, he said. Who put this banner on the chariot? And what are pizzas? Would you like to try one? Asked Diana. 
They taste good, said the emperor. You can deliver some to the palace, but I don't want banners on the chariot, so take your banner away. Just then, the magic key glowed. Chip looked at the little banner. He put it on Biff's chariot. The emperor didn't like banners on chariots, he said. I wonder what Mrs. May will think. The Jigsaw Puzzle It was raining. The children were fed up. Biff and Anina were bored, and Chip was in the bad mood. He wanted to play with the frisbee. Mom had an idea. She had a new jigsaw puzzle. She gave it to the children. You can do this jigsaw, she said. It's a good one. Everyone looked at the jigsaw. It was a picture of soldiers and a boy. The soldiers are asking the boy a question, said Mom. They wanted to know where his father is. The jigsaw puzzle had lots of pieces. The children liked the jigsaw, but it was hard to do. Soon, Chip got bored with it. He began to play with the frisbee. In the end, everyone got bored. The magic key began to glow. The magic took the children into a new adventure. The magic took the children to a time long ago. It took them to a big house. Some children were playing with their mother and father. Keeper looked at the children. What funny clothes they are wearing, he said. They look like the children in the picture on the jigsaw, said Anina. Keeper spoke to the girl and boy. Hello, he said. My name is Keeper. This is Biff, Chip, and Anina. What funny names, said the girl. And what funny clothes you are wearing. What are your names? asked the chip. My name is Jane, said girl. My name is Edmund, said the boy. And my father is very important. We don't mind, said keeper. Edmund had never seen a frisbee before. Why have you got a plate? he asked. It's not a plate, said keeper. It's a frisbee. Everyone played with it. Suddenly, there was a shout. A man ran toward Edmund's father. Quickly, you must hide, he said. Get inside the house. The soldiers are coming. Edmund's father ran inside. Quickly, shouted Edmund. We must help my father to hide. The soldiers mustn't find him. Everyone ran into the house. The soldiers came to the house. They knocked on the door. Let us in, they shouted. Open the door, or we will smash it down. Everyone ran to the library. The library had a secret room. The room was behind the bookcase. Edmund's father hid in the secret room. Good luck, father, said Edmund. Edmund's mother pushed the bookcase back. Don't tell the soldiers about the secret room, said Jane. They will kill my father if they find him. The soldiers ran into the house. They looked for Edmund's father. Tell us where he is, they shouted. The children were frightened, but they didn't say anything. The soldiers looked everywhere, but they couldn't find Edmund's father. One of the soldiers found a sword. His sword is here, he said. So he must be here somewhere. Soldiers took everyone into a room. Some men sat at a big table. They looked at the children. One of them looked at Keeper. Come here, little boy, he said. Where is your father? asked the man. Keeper was frightened, but he didn't say anything. None of the children said anything. The important man was angry. Your father is hiding, they shouted. Tell us where he is. If he is hiding in this house, we will soon find him. Nobody said anything. 
So the soldiers began to pull up the floor. They tapped on the walls. Edmund's mom was frightened. They may find him, she said. Edmund and Jane were frightened. They wanted to help their father. Suddenly, Chip had an idea. Maybe your father could escape if he dressed up as a woman, he said. Biff and Nina had an idea too. Biff threw the frisbee at the soldier. The soldier laughed. He had never seen a frisbee before. Come and look at this, he shouted. The soldiers wanted to rest, so they stopped looking for Edmund's father. They all went outside and played with the frisbee. Soon everyone was laughing. The soldiers liked the frisbee. They played with it for a long time. Suddenly, an old woman came up. She looked very poor. She wanted some money. The soldiers stopped playing with the frisbee. They shouted at the old woman. Go away! They shouted. We don't have any money. Suddenly, one of the soldiers looked at the house. He saw someone running away. Look! Over there! He shouted. Someone's running away! The soldiers chased the woman. It's not a woman, it's a man, they shouted. It must be the man we want. Don't let him get away. The soldiers caught the man and took him back to the house. Oh no, said the Nina. They've caught Edmund's father. Our idea didn't work. The soldiers thought they had caught Edmund's father, but it was a trick. Ah! <sighs> said the soldiers. Hooray, said the children. The children found some old clothes, so Edmund's father was the old woman, said Anina. What a good trick, laughed everyone. Suddenly the magic key began to glow. The jigsaw puzzle was finished. Mom looked at something in the picture. That's funny, she said. That looks like a frisbee. It must be a plate, said Chip. The Power Cut The family was going on holiday. They were taking Biff and Chip. Mom and Dad were busy packing the car. Will you pack these for us, please? asked Wilma. There will be lots to do, said Dad. You won't need those. We will, said Wilf. We must take the game station. I've got a great new game. We wanted to watch these films, said Wilma. We haven't seen some of them yet. And can we take the CD player, asked Biff. It was a long journey. It took hours. They stopped for a break. Let's get a drink, said mom. Can we play a game in the arcade first, asked Wilf. At last, they arrived at the cottage. We are in the middle of the forest, said Wilf. We are in the middle of the nowhere, said Wilma. They went inside the cottage. Mom and dad began to unpack the car. There was a big television in the front room. Great, said Chip. Let's watch TV. We could play some games, said Wilf. Could you bring in our game station, Dad? Not now, said Dad. Come and help us unpack the car. At breakfast, Wilma put on a film. Dad sighed. Get dressed, everyone. We didn't come on holiday to watch TV. Can we watch this first? asked Wilma. Later, said Dad. Let's go out. Wasn't it fun on the beach today? said Mom. But nobody said anything. Wolf and Biff were busy playing a game. Chip and Wilma were listening to a CD. Suddenly, all the lights went out. The television and the TV player went off. What's happened? called Biff. Dad came in with a torch. 
"There's been a power cut," he said. Mom found a lamp. "What if the power doesn't come back on?" asked the chip, looking at the TV. "We will have to do without it," said Dad. "Oh no," said the children. The power didn't come back on. It may be off for a long time," said Dad. It was time to eat. They all sat round the table and had supper by candlelight. It was fun eating in the dark. They took it in turns to tell stories. Dad told them a funny story about a time when he was a little boy. It made them all laugh. That night, the power didn't come back on. Children had to use the lamp to go to bed. Chip made a shadow on the wall with his hands. Guess what it is? He said. Wilma shone a torch under her chin. The light made her face look scary. Woo! She said. I'm a monster. Everyone laughed. Then Mom came in and said it was time to go to sleep. The next morning. There was still no power, so the family spent all day on the beach. They played lots of games. It's late," said Mom. "It's time to go. Can't we stay a bit longer?" asked Wolf. "I've got an idea," said Dad. "Let's build a fire. We could cook supper." "Brilliant!" they all shouted. "Let's get some driftwood," said Mom. "I will go and get the food." Said Dad. It was getting dark by the time the fire was finished. Hey, Wolf. That looks like a giant bird's nest, said Mom. You light it, not lay an egg in it. Dad cooked lots of food on the fire. Then Mom toasted some marshmallows. They all sat and looked at the stars. I have a surprise, said Dad. Sparklers. Sorry," said Dad the next morning. "Still no power. We can do without it." Smiled Chip. "Last night was magic," said Will. "What shall we do tonight?" asked Biff. That night, Wilma had a good idea. "We could play hide and seek," she said. "If you are it, you have a torch." Everyone hid around the dark cottage. Wolf was it. He counted to a hundred. Wolf looked in every room. Found you, Biff! He called. Biff was hiding behind a big plant. He found Chip lying in the bath. Wilma was behind the TV. Mom was under a bed, but where was Dad? Suddenly, the moon came out from behind the clouds. It lit up the windows. Dad was hiding behind the curtains. That gives me an idea, thought Wilma. The next day, Biff, Chip, and Wolf went with Wilma to the woods. Why have we brought the boxes and a sheet? asked Chip. Why are we here so early? yawned Wolf. There's loads to do before tonight. Wilma's eyes sparkled. This evening we are going to do a shadow play. Brilliant," said Chip. "What's that?" The children worked all day. They cut out shapes from the cardboard boxes. Wolf tied the sheet between two trees. "What are you doing?" Dad asked. "It's a surprise." Said Wilma. There was a golden sunset that evening. The children had put down lots of candles in jars. How beautiful! Said Mom. It's like magic, gasped Dad. Suddenly, Biff turned up the lamp. The sheet glowed. The play began. It was about elves. The elves were cardboard puppets. Wolf and Chip moved the puppets around. Biff did the elves' voices. Wilma played the guitar. They all sang songs. It was a good story. It was funny and sad. It made Mom laugh and Dad cry. 
The play had finished. Everyone bowed. Hooray! Shouted Mom. Well done. Now, said Dad, I've got a surprise. What is it? Asked Wilma. You'll see. Smiled Dad. They went back to the cottage. It was pitch black. We can't see anything, said Wolf. I said, you'll see, and now you can, said Dad. He turned on the power. Dad laughed. Surprise, he said. I wanted you to enjoy the holiday without TV. There was no power cut. Turn it off again, said the children. We can do without it. Australian Adventure. Floppy had not been for a walk. We should take Floppy out," said Mom. Chip groaned. "Walking Floppy is boring." "Well, you could bring the boomerangs," said Mom. Biff threw her boomerang really hard. It flew up into the sky. "I will show them I'm not boring," thought Floppy. I will make them laugh. Floppy chased after Boomerang. Suddenly, it turned in the air. Floppy turned as well. Mind the pond! Shouted Mom. Too late! Laughed Chip. Splash! Floppy landed in the pond. Oh, Floppy, you're filthy! Said Mom. Everyone laughed. Floppy was pleased. At least I made them laugh," he thought. Floppy was not so pleased when he got home. Mom wanted to give him a wash. "Let's use the hose pipe," she said. "Oh no," thought Floppy. Floppy hid under Biff's bed. "Why do I need a wash?" he thought. "Dogs like being dirty." Suddenly, the magic key began to glow. It was time for a new adventure. Dogs don't have magic adventures by themselves, do they? Thought Floppy. Well, it's better than a bath. The magic key took Floppy to Australia. It took him to a red desert. The sand was hot. It hurt Floppy's paws. Suddenly, a boomerang flew over his head. Whoosh! Another one landed next to him. Then Floppy saw some men. "Go away, you dirty dingo!" they shouted. Floppy ran away. The men chased him. He ran past some rocks. "Quick!" said the voice. "Hide here!" The men ran past. Behind the rocks were four dogs. They all laughed at Floppy. "What floppy ears!" Said one of them. "What's your name?" asked another. "Floppy," said Floppy. "My name is Red," said Red. "This is Ginger. She's Amber, and he's called Tan. We're dingoes." "What's a dingo?" asked Floppy. "That's what men call us," said Amber. "Why did they chase me?" asked Floppy. The dingoes look sad. We used to be friends," said Tan, "but now men don't like us because we have fleas." "We'll show you," said Red. The dingoes took Floppy to a cave. On the walls of the cave were paintings. Some of the paintings were of animals Floppy had never seen before. "These are very old paintings," said Amber. They show a time when man and dingoes lived together. We used to help man get food and sleep near their fires," said Red. "If only we didn't have fleas," said Tan. Outside the cave, it was getting dark. The night was cold. Far away, the man had lit a fire. "Let's hide near the man," said Red. One of the men was telling a story. It was about a long time ago, when the world began. Those times long ago were called the Dream Time," whispered Amber. 
The story was about a creature called a kangaroo. The kangaroo wanted to steal fire from man. Floppy was tired. He closed his eyes. He began to dream. In Floppy's dream, he met a strange animal with a long tail. It looked like one of the cave paintings. What's your name? asked Floppy. They call me Kangaroo, he said. Kangaroo wanted to make a fire. He rubbed two sticks together. This is how men make fire, he said. Suddenly, the stick caught fire. It made Kangaroo jump. He dropped the sticks. The dry grass caught fire. The fire spread quickly. Kangaroo jumped up and down. It's hot! It's hot! He said. Run to the water hole, said Floppy. All the animals ran to the water hole. As they went into the water, fleas began to jump off their backs. Ah, fleas don't like getting wet, thought Floppy. Floppy woke up. He had an idea. He crept up to one of the men and picked up his boomerang. I have a plan, Floppy said to Dingoes. I think I can get rid of your fleas. You can, said Amber. Then we can make friends with the man. We need to find the water hole, said Floppy. Follow us, said Red. They walked for a long time. At last, they got to the water hole. Pick up the boomerang, said Floppy, and walk backward into the water. Ginger walked backward into the water. The fleas on his legs began to crawl onto his back. They did not want to get wet. Keep going, said Floppy. Ginger went deeper. Soon his back was under the water. The fleas crawled onto his head. They did not want to get wet. All the fleas were now on Ginger's head. Now put your head under the water, said Floppy. Ginger lay down in the water. The fleas crawled up his nose and onto the boomerang. Let go of the boomerang. Said Floppy. The boomerang floated away. The fleas stayed on the boomerang. Hooray! cheered the dingoes. Now we can all get rid of our fleas and make friends with the man, said Amber. I hope so, said Floppy. The magic key began to glow. It was time for Floppy to go home. Oh no, said Floppy. I didn't bring anything back from my adventure. Floppy heard Mom calling. She was still in the garden. Floppy, it's bath time, she said. Mom washed Floppy with the hose pipe. Fleas, she said. How did you get fleas? Floppy picked up the boomerang. I'm off to the park, he thought. I need to find a water hole. The Riddle Stone, Part One. Dad had pulled up some floorboards. Hello, he said. What's this? Under the floor was a stone. It had some strange writing on it. Dad was going to throw the stone away, but Chip wanted to keep it. Look at this, he said to Biff. Do you think the writing is Chinese? I don't know, said Biff. Chip took the stone to school. He showed it to a boy called Hong. It is written in Chinese, said Hong. I can't read it, but my grandfather can. Hong's grandfather always came after school to take Hong home. Chip showed him the stone. Yes, it is Chinese, said Hong's grandfather. He says, "Do you mind?" What a strange question, said Biff. It may be a riddle," said Hong's grandfather. "See, the stone is broken. Maybe the answer, maybe the answer is on the other half." Chip gave Hong the stone to keep. He put it in his bag. "May Hong come round to play with us?" asked Biff. "All right," said Hong's grandfather. They went to play in Biff's room. "What is a riddle?" Asked Chip, "It's a puzzle in words," said Hong. 
Here is a good riddle," said Hong. "How do you spell hungry horse? Using only four letters." "We don't know," said Biff. "It's easy," laughed Hong. "M T G G." Here's another riddle. What is this? The more it dries, the more it gets wet. Suddenly, the magic key began to glow. The magic took them to a rocky valley. Four paths met. There was a single post pointing four ways. Each way pointed to Riddle Mountain. A boy was sitting on a rock. My name is Tai, he said. I want to go to Riddle Mountain, but I don't know which path to take. I can't think of the answer to this riddle. The riddle was on a tall post. It said, "It's only one color, but it can grow. Sticks to your feet wherever you go. There is the sun, not in the rain. Never does harm, never feels pain." The answer is a shadow," said Hong. "Look at the shadow of the post. It points up that path. That must be the way. Are you sure?" asked Biff. "Yes, it's a riddle," said Tai. "Let's go." "It is hard to get to Riddle Mountain," said Tai. "It will be dangerous. I may never get there." Then why do you have to go? Asked Biff. I want to be the riddle maker, said Tai. I have to get to Riddle Mountain. I have to answer all the riddles on the way. The last riddle is the hardest. No one has ever found the answer. Suddenly, a huge giant stood in the way. I hope he's friendly, said Chip. Answer this riddle, and you can pass by," roared the giant. "Write down how much I weigh," he said. "But he must weigh tons," said Biff. "No, it's a riddle," said Hong. "I can do it." He wrote down the answer. "Good luck in the land of the riddles," said the giant. "What did you write down?" asked Chip. I wrote the word "how much I weigh," said Hong. It was not far to the top of the hill. Suddenly, a dragon stood in the way. I hope he's friendly," said Hong. "Look," said Biff. "There are bubbles coming out of his mouth." The dragon spoke. "Over there is Riddle Mountain," it said. "You have a long way to go." "Help," said Tai. The journey looks dangerous. Below was a black lake. Across the lake, the land was dry and rocky. Beyond, there was a deep river and dark forest. Far away was a tall gray mountain. Huge bubbles came out of the dragon's jaws. Answer this riddle," he said. "How many sides does a bubble have?" That's easy," said Hong. "It has two. The inside and the outside," he said. "Good," said the dragon. "Now step inside the bubble." Hong stepped into the bubble. It began to float away. "Step into a bubble!" yelled Hong. They all stepped inside the bubbles and floated up and up. "This is scary," said Biff. What if the bubbles pop? They floated on and on. At last, they began to float down to the black lake. I hope the bubbles don't pop here," yelled Chip. Then the bubbles popped, and the children fell into the lake. Suddenly, a huge serpent rose out of the water. "I don't like this adventure," said Biff. "What is this?" said the serpent. The more it dries, the more it gets wet. It's easy," said Hong. "It's a towel." "Good," said the serpent. "Now climb on my back." The serpents swam across the lake. "How do you know the answer to all these riddles, Hong?" asked Tai. "I don't know," said Hong. "They just come to me." 
Goblins were waiting for the children. They pulled and pinched them. Ouch! That hurts, said Chip. Ha! You won't answer the next riddle, said one of the goblins. The goblins put the children in a cage. One of the goblins stole magic key. Oh no, said Biff. Now we can't get back from this adventure. The goblin king spoke to them. Answer this, he said. How do you want to die? We don't want to die, said Chip. Hong began to laugh. It's not funny, said Biff. We don't want to die. It's a riddle, said Hong. Don't worry, I know the answer. The Riddle Stone Part 2 The Goblin King looked at the children. His small eyes glinted and he snapped his long, thin fingers. How do you want to die? he asked. We want to die of old age, said Hong. That is the right answer, said the Goblin King. So I must let you go. He opened the door of the cage. Brilliant, said Chip. But how did you know the right answer? I don't know, said Hong. I just did. Let's find the next riddle, said Tai. The goblins still have the magic key, said Biff. We must get it back. Give us back our key, said Chip. No, said the goblin. We won't. Give it back, shouted Chip. Make us, called the goblins. Hong had an idea. He spoke to the goblin king. We will ask you a riddle, Hong said. You must give us back the key if you can't answer it. All right, said the goblin king. What is the riddle? Hong wrote in the sand, one plus one equals six. Make this work by drawing a straight line, he said. The goblins scratched their hands. At last, they said, we can't do it. Hong put a line on the plus. One and one and four add up to six, said Hong. Very clever, said the Goblin King, and he gave Biff the key. The children went on. At last, they came to a flat desert. There were strange shapes in the sky. Suddenly, the shapes flew down and whizzed over the children's head. Ouch! That one hit me, said Tai. The flying shapes were kites. The kites dived at the children. What is the answer to this riddle? shouted the kite flyer. I can be cracked. I can be played. I can be told. I can be made. What am I? I know this one, said Hong. The answer is a joke. The kite flyer let them pass. But next, they came to a wide river. We can never cross this, said Chip. It's too deep and dangerous. Then they saw an old man on a raft. I will take you across, said the old man. But first, answer this riddle. I have seven children. Half of them are boys. How can this be? I know the answer, said Hong. All your children are boys. That is right, said the old man. I will take you across the river. How do you know the answer to all the riddles? Tai asked Hong. I don't know, said Hong. The answers just come to me. The children came to a dark, gloomy forest. 
the trees were bent and twisted. What a scary place, said Biff. I can see eyes looking at us. Suddenly, wolves sprang out of the trees. They had red eyes and long, sharp white teeth. They're after us, yelled Chip. Run! The children ran fast, but the wolves were faster. Quick! yelled Biff. Climb a tree! The children climbed quickly, but Hong was a bit slow. A wolf sprang up at him. The wolf snapped at Hong. It sank its teeth into his back and pulled it off his back. Help! yelled Hong. Then a strange woman came out of the trees. The wolves ran up to her. The wolf woman told the wolves to sit. She told the children to climb down. The wolf woman picked up Hong's bag, but she gave it to Tai. Answer this riddle, she said. It lives half its life. It dies half of its life. It dances to no music. It drinks with no mouth. This time, Tai knew the answer. That's easy, he said. It's a tree. Good, said the wolf woman. The next riddle is at the Riddle Mountain. No one has ever got it right. The children went on. Then Biff said, Hong has known the answers to all the riddles, but not the last one. Why? I don't know, said Hong. It's strange, said Biff. By now, they were at Riddle Mountain. At the top was a cave. The last riddle will be up there, said Tai. Come on. They climbed up to the cave. What to climb, said Chip. I'm tired. Let's have a rest, said Tai. The children sat down. Tai took off Hong's bag. Suddenly the ground began to shake. A stone statue rose up out of the earth. The statue opened its hand and spoke. Who answers this riddle? Will be the riddle maker, it said. This is the riddle, said the statue. If the answer I give is yes, but what I mean is no, then what is the question? Everyone looked at Hong. I don't know the answer, said Hong. Neither do I, said Tai sadly. We failed, said Biff. Wait, said Chip. I have an idea. Where is that stone with the Chinese writing, he asked. It's in my bag, said Hong. Tai knew the wolf woman's riddle, and he had Hong's bag, said Biff. Maybe... Whoever has the stone can answer riddles, said Chip. Tai took the stone out of the bag. I know the answer to the question, he said. It is. Do you mind? Tai put the stone in the statue's hand. It is the right answer, said the statue. You are the new riddle maker. Just then, the magic key began to glow. The adventure was over. So we knew the answer all along, said Chip. It was on the stone. Well, I didn't want to be the riddle maker, said Hong. Did you? No, said Biff. And I never wanted to hear another riddle. A sea mystery. It's the last day of the holiday, said Keeper. I've seen something I wanted to buy before we go home. Keeper took Biff and Chip to an old shop. Inside, it looked dark and dusty. In the window was a model of a fishing boat. I wanted to buy that boat, said Keeper. The shop was full of things for boats. An old man sat in the corner. 
Excuse me, said Chip. We'd like to buy the model boat. How much is it? It's not for sale, said the old man. That boat is a model of my great grandfather's fishing boat. It was made after he was lost at sea. What happened to him? asked Biff. No one knows, said the old man. One day he went to sea in his boat and he never came back. The old man began to cough. Now, go away. I want to shut the shop. He said. Kipa was upset. He wasn't a very nice man. He said. Never mind, Kipa said. Mom, I will buy you an ice lolly to cheer you up. The children sat on the sea wall eating their lollies. Suddenly, they heard a cough. It was the old man. He was holding a little model rowing boat. What do you want? Asked Biff nervously. I'm sorry, I was rude," said the old man. "I bought you a present." He gave Kipa the little boat. "It's from the model you liked," he said. The little boat was made of wood. It looked very real. It even had a little pair of oars. "Oh, thank you," said Kipa. He looked up, but the old man had gone. It's time to go home. I'm afraid," said Dad. "Did you see where the old man went?" asked Chip. "What old man?" asked Dad. When they got home, the children went to Biff's room. They wanted to play with the model boat. "Oh," said Chip. "I've broken off an oar." Just then, the key began to glow. The children landed in water. The magic had taken them out to sea. Where are we? Yelled Biff. I'm scared, said Keeper. I'm not a very good swimmer. Suddenly, the oar splashed into the sea next to them. Hold on to that oar, said Biff. It will keep us afloat. The children held on to the oar. They floated for a long time. There's nothing but sea," said Biff. "I don't like this adventure," said Chip. It began to get foggy. Then they saw a strange shape through the fog. It was getting bigger and bigger. Now I'm scared," said Biff. A sailing boat came out of the fog. It drifted toward the children. "Over here!" shouted Chip. "Help!" yelled Keeper. I can't see anyone," said Biff. As the boat got near, Chip saw a rope hanging into the water. Tie the rope to the oar, then we can climb on board," said Chip. They climbed up onto the boat. "Whew!" said Keeper. "That was scary." "Let's find the crew," said Biff. "They can tell us where we are." They looked around. On deck, there were nets and baskets of fish. There was an open hatch leading down into the boat. Maybe they are down below," said Chip. The children went down into a large cabin. It was lit by lamps. There was a big table in the middle of the cabin. The table was set for dinner. In the corner, a big pot of stew was bubbling away on a stove. On the table, there were five mugs of hot tea. This is strange," said Biff. "There's nobody on board." "There has to be," said Chip. "Why would the food be hot? And who lit the lamps?" asked the keeper. Suddenly, there was a loud crash above them. The boat shook. The children ran up on deck. The fog had gone. It was windy. The crash must have been the sail," said Biff. "It has caught the wind. The boat's turned around," said Chip. The boat started to move quickly. "I will try to steer it," said Biff. "Good," said Chip. "I will tie down the sail. Keep her." 
go to the front and look out. Look out, shouted Kipper. Rocks! Hold on, shouted Biff. She turned the wheel hard. Chip fell over, but the boat missed the rocks. That was close, yelled Kipper. The boat sailed on. Suddenly, Kipper saw a little rowing boat. In it were two men and a boy. They were waving. Help us! They shouted. We can't row. We've only got one oar. Chip pulled up the oar. He threw it to the man. They caught the oar. Then the man rowed to the boat and climbed on. Who are you? Asked Biff. I'm Captain Tarbot. This is Flounder, and the boy's called Shrimp," said the captain. "This is our boat, the Barnacle." "What happened to you?" asked Kipper. "We were about to eat," said Flounder. "Shrimp was pulling up the last net when we stuck a rock, and he fell in. We got in the boat to help him," said the captain. "But we only had one oar." We couldn't roll back. Where did you find our oar? Said Shrimp. It's a mystery, said the captain. We always keep the oars in the rowing boat. Chip thought about the model. It is a mystery, he said. Suddenly, the magic key began to glow. The magic took them back to Bib's room. Oh no, said Keeper. We left the oar. They looked at the model boat. It had both its oars. It's a mystery," said Chip. The big breakfast. Ding, 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 ding. Dad came into Chip's room. He was ringing a bell. Chip sat up in bed. It's time to get up," said Dad. "Mom's away, and we have a lot of jobs to do." Dad rang the bell on the stairs. Time to get up, he called. Do we have to? Asked Biff. It's the weekend. Yes, said Dad. Mom's gets back tonight. The house is a mess. We must tidy up. I suppose so, yawned Chip. Good. I will start breakfast, said Dad. The children came down for breakfast. Bad news, said Dad. The milk has gone off. I burned the toast, and we have run out of juice. I'm sorry. Oh no," said Keeper. "I'm hungry." We will have to go to the supermarket," said Dad. "We need some more food." "I've got a better idea," said Chip. "Let's have breakfast in the cafe." "You can eat what you like," said Dad. Then we will do the shopping. Hooray! Said Keeper. I'm going to have a big breakfast. I like blueberry pancakes. Said Biff. I want eggs. Said Keeper. Why not have a keeper, Keeper? Said Chip. Only if you have chips, Chip. Said Keeper. At home, Dad told the children to start their jobs. I will put the shopping away. He said, "You go and tidy your rooms. That big breakfast should give you lots of energy." The children looked at the mess. "Let's tidy up later," said Chip. "I'm so full, I can't move." "No chance of walk then," thought Floppy. Just then, the magic key began to glow. The magic took them back in time. It took them to a big house. It took them into a large hall with a big staircase. It's still dark outside," said Biff. "Ding ding!" A bell began to ring. Suddenly, a door opened. A little girl came in. She was holding a candle. "I'm Rose. You must be the new servants. The housekeeper will see you now. Follow me," she said. Rose took them down a corridor. Into a large storeroom, the housekeeper was waiting for them. 
"You are late," she said sternly. There are lots of jobs to be done. She gave the children a list of jobs. Begin with the cleaning, she said. It has to be done before breakfast. Ah,、oh, I see you have brought a dog. Good. Rose took them to a large kitchen. This is Mrs. Fry," said Rose. "She is the cook." "Hello," said Mrs. Fry. "I see you have brought a dog. Good. Why is everyone pleased that we have brought a dog?" asked Chip. Mrs. Fry pointed at the wooden wheel. "Put your dog in here," she said. "I may not like this," thought Floppy. Rose put Floppy in the wheel. The wheel turns the meat over the fire," said Rose. "It stops the meat burning." "You look like a giant hamster," laughed Keeper. "Now we must hurry. There's so much to do," said Rose. "Lord Plum will be up soon. We must finish the jobs, then we can get his breakfast ready." Mrs. Fry put the meat on the spit. We need this for Lord Plum's breakfast. She looked at Floppy. Keep walking and don't stop, she said. Funny ways to get a walk, thought Floppy. What else is for breakfast? Asked Biff. Keeper's oyster bread, beet trout pancakes, ale and ice cream. Nothing too fancy, said Rose. I will get it ready. You get on with the jobs on the list. Biff had to scrub the clothes clean. She beat the rugs. Then she had to make some bread, and put powder on some wigs. Chip had to clean all the fireplaces. Then he had to collect a lot of coal. Next, he had to polish the silver, and polish all the boots. Keeper churned milk to make butter. He got ice cream from the ice house. He had to carry water to the bathrooms, and scrub all the floors. Come quickly," said Rose. "The food is ready. We must take it to the dining room. Hurry up, and don't forget Lord Plum's newspaper," said Mrs. Fry. The children put out the dishes on a big table. Hurry up," said the housekeeper. "Lord Plum will be down soon. He won't want to see you here." At last, breakfast was finished. Was Lord Plum happy with his breakfast? Asked Keeper. "No," said the housekeeper. "You forgot to iron his newspaper." "I'm worn out," said Keeper. I never want another walk," said Floppy. "At least we can have a rest now," said Chip. "A rest," said Rose. "We have to start getting ready for lunch." Suddenly, the magic key began to glow. It was time to go home. "What a relief," said Biff. "That was hard work," said Biff. Dad came into Biff's room. "Hurry up," he said. We've still got lots of jobs to do. Then we have to walk Floppy. Oh no," said everyone. Early next morning, the children made Mama surprise breakfast. What a big breakfast," said Mom. "You have gone to so much trouble." It was nothing," said Biff. Rumpel still tisking. In the far off times, there lived a poor miller and his daughter Lily. Lily was kind and clever and good, but the miller was a show-off who liked to tell tall tales. Lily was in love with the prince, but was too poor to be his wife. So the miller went to the king and boasted about his daughter. 
She can spin straws into pure gold, he said. The king was delighted and summoned Lily to the castle. There, he took her to a turret and showed her a bale of straw. Spin it into gold by morning and you may marry my son, he said. Then he locked the door. But of course, Lily had no idea what to do and stamped her foot crossly. At this sound, a goblin appeared. Give me your necklace and I will spin the straw into gold, he said. Lily's necklace had belonged to her mother, so she did not want to give it away. Yet she did want to marry the prince, so she agreed. The goblin was as good as his word and spun the straw into reels of gold. The king was pleased, but he was also greedy. He took Lily to another turret with two bale of straw. Spin it into gold by morning and you may marry my son, he said. Then he locked the door. Again, Lily stamped her foot and again the goblin appeared. Give me your ring and I will spin the straw into gold for you, he said. Lily gave him the ring and the goblin spun the straw into reels of gold. The king smiled when he saw the gold, but it made him greedier still. He took Lily to another turret with three bales of straw. Spin it into gold by morning and you may marry my son, he said. Then he locked the door. Again, Lily stamped her foot and again the goblin appeared. I have nothing left to give you, she said, but I need your help. So the goblin thought and replied, Give me your first child and I will spin the straw into gold. Lily, who did not much care for babies, agreed and the goblin spun the straw into reels of gold. This time the king kept his word and Lily married the prince. The years passed and in her happiness Lily forgot that she did not much care for babies. She and the prince had a little boy. They called him Tom. Lily also forgot her promise to the goblin, but goblin did not forget. On Tom's first birthday, he came to the castle and said, Give me your baby. Lily could not bear to be parted from Tom and offered the goblin gold instead. But the goblin said Tom was the only treasure he wanted. But as I have told you, Lily was a clever girl. If I can guess your name, will you let me keep Tom? She said. I will give you three days, said the goblin, but you will not win. The child will be mine. Lily set to work. On the first day, she wrote down all the boys' names she had heard of. When the goblin came that evening, she said, Is your name Adam? No, smiled the goblin. That is not my name. Is it Ahmed? asked Lily. No, smiled the goblin. That is not my name. Lily tried Akim and Anton and Hassan and Hans. Each time the goblin said the same thing. No, that's not my name. On the second day, Lily went to the castle library and wrote down all the boys' names she hadn't heard of. When the goblin came that evening, she said, Is your name Achilles? No, smiled the goblin. That is not my name. Is it Axel? asked Lily. No, smiled the goblin. That is not my name. Lily tried Karine and Casper and Santos and Solomon. Each time the goblin said the same thing. 
No, that is not my name. On the third day, Lily had run out of ideas. So she went for a long walk into town. She walked around the market, listening out for anyone with a different name. The only names she found in the market were ones she had already tried, like James, Jack and Jonas. Lily had almost given up hope when she saw a market stall selling reels of thread. A little man was singing to himself as he stacked them in neat piles. He sang, My name is not Joe, my name is not Jim, my name is Rumpelstiltskin. Lily smiled, because she could see that little man was the very same goblin who wanted to take Tom away. When the goblin came that evening, she pretended not to know. Is your name Gumboot? She said. No, smiled the goblin. That is not my name. Is it Marmalade? Asked Lily. No, smiled the goblin. That is not my name. Lily tried Slurp and Squelch and Mutton and Tintin. But each time the goblin said the same thing. No, that is not my name. Then Lily had one last guess. Is your name Rumpelstiltskin? She asked. The goblin stamped his foot so hard it went through the floor. He pulled with all his might, but he was stuck fast. Lily offered to help him as long as he vanished forever. The angry goblin disappeared. Tom stayed in the castle with Lily and the prince and for all I know, they are living there still. Baba Yaga Once upon a time, there was a little Russian girl called Natasha. Her mother had died when she was a baby, but she and her father were very happy until he got married again. That is, Natasha was sweet, kind and clever, yet her father's new wife hated her and was horrible when he wasn't around. One day, her stepmother told Natasha she had a special job for her to do. I, um, need to borrow a needle and thread from my sister, said the stepmother with a wicked grin. Off you go now. She lives deep in the forest, and her name is Baba Yaga. Natasha's heart sank. She knew her stepmother was up to something. Natasha didn't like the sound of this sister. She had heard some people say that Baba Yaga was an evil witch. Natasha tried hard to get out of it, but her stepmother said she had to go. So Natasha sighed, tied up some scraps of food in an old napkin to keep her going and headed toward the dark wood. I have a bad feeling about this, she muttered, and she walked alone. She walked across the fields and into the forest, and she came at last to a clearing. There she saw the strangest sight, a hut standing on a giant chicken legs. Natasha opened the gate, and it squeaked almost as if it was in a pain. Why, you poor thing, she said and gave it some oil from a can she found nearby. Next, a big scary dog rolled at her. She calmed him down with some food from her napkin and some kind words. Then Baba Yaga herself appeared. She had burning red eyes and teeth made of iron. Natasha gulped. Please Baba Yaga, she said. Your sister wants to borrow a needle and thread. Is that so? said the witch. 
She licked her thin lips and looked Natasha up and down. Well, you'd better come and wait in my hut while I find them, my dear. Baba Yaga whistled and the hut came running over. Natasha climbed up nervously and stood in the gloom. The only light came from a big iron stove in the corner. Make yourself at home, said Baba Yaga with a wicked smile. I will be back in a moment. It's getting late. Perhaps you'd like to stay for dinner? The witch didn't wait for an answer and hurried off. Natasha peeped out. She saw Baba Yaga wasn't looking for a needle and thread at all. She was fetching wood for the stove. You do realize you're the only item on the menu, don't you? She's the soft voice behind Natasha. Baba Yaga just loves to eat sweet little girls. Natasha turned around. A terribly thin black cat came out of the shadows. Well, I knew she wasn't very nice, said Natasha with a frown. And I can see she doesn't feed you much either. Here, have my last few scraps of food. What a kind girl you are, said the cat, surprised. You know, I might be able to help you. Take these and run for your life, said the cat. He gave her a towel, a comb, and a small stone. Throw each one behind you when Baba Yaga gets close. Natasha thanked the cat and quietly jumped down from the hut. The dog saw her go but didn't bark, and the gate opened and closed without a squeak. The witch was very cross indeed when she found out her dinner had run off. You should have warned me, she yelled at the cat, the dog, and the gate. Why, said the cat, she was nice to us, and you've always been horrid. Baba Yaga scowled and stamped her foot. Then she hurried off after Natasha. Natasha ran down the forest path as fast as she could go. Soon she noticed all the little forest creatures overtaking her. Baba Yaga wasn't far behind. You might as well give up now, yelled the witch. You won't get away. Natasha kept running, but Baba Yaga was on the point of catching her. Suddenly, Natasha remembered the things she was carrying and the wise words of the cat. She threw the towel behind her and it turned into a raging river between her and the witch. Bother! shouted Baba Yaga, shaking her fist. Phew! thought Natasha. But Baba Yaga simply drank the river and Natasha ran off once more. She shot out of the forest and headed across the fields, Baba Yaga closing in behind her. Natasha threw the comb over her shoulder and it turned into another forest. Bother! screamed Baba Yaga, shaking her fist. Before Natasha could even think few, the witch started chewing a path through the trees. Baba Yaga kept on coming, and Natasha knew she only had one chance left. The witch was almost on top of her when she threw the small stone, and this time Baba Yaga was bitten. The stone turned into a mountain. Serves you right, said Natasha with a smile. Then she headed for home. Her stepmother was very surprised to see her. Natasha told her father all about what had happened and how her stepmother had planned it all alone. He was so cross, 
he told his wife to pack her bags and get out of their lives forever. Good riddance to bad rubbish, he said. Natasha smiled. She had to agree. Cinderella. Once upon a time, there was a girl called Cinderella. She had a loving father, but he was often away. Her stepmother didn't like her, nor did her bad-tempered stepsisters. They made Cinderella stay in the kitchen all day long, washing dishes, sweeping floors, and looking after the fire. She even slept in the kitchen among the cinders. One day, they came running into the kitchen. Look, Cinderella, an invitation from the king! cried the sulky one. We are going to a ball! cried the stroppy one. At the palace, us, not you! They added, smirking. They began to argue about shoes and dresses. They were still arguing on the night of the ball when poor Cinderella had to help them get dressed. When they had gone, she couldn't help feeling sad. I wish I could go to the ball, she sighed. Suddenly, the gloomy kitchen lit up. Flash! You can, my dear. Looking up, Cinderella saw a kind old lady. Well, what? Who are you? I'm your fairy godmother, said the old lady. And I say you can go to the ball. But how? cried Cinderella. In a coach, of course. The fairy godmother laughed. She sent Cinderella into the garden to get a pumpkin. Then she waved her magic wand. Flash! The pumpkin turned into a golden coach. Now you need horses, said the fairy godmother. Let these mice out of the cage, please. Cinderella did as she was told. The fairy godmother waved her wand and flash. Four white horses stood before the golden coach. Now, said the fairy godmother, pointing her wand at the cat. All you need is a jolly coachman. Flash! Now you can go to the ball, she cried. But Cinderella looked down at her old clothes. What about my dress? Oh! laughed the fairy godmother. I nearly forgot. She waved her wand again. And flash! Looking down, Cinderella saw the most beautiful dress she had ever seen. Put these on too, said the fairy godmother, giving her a pair of slippers. Made of glass, they fitted perfectly. Now you really are ready, said the fairy godmother. Have fun! Just remember one thing, you must be home by midnight. When the clock strikes twelve, all my magic will end. Your coach will turn back into a pumpkin and your beautiful clothes will once again be rags. I will remember, cried Cinderella, as she climbed eagerly into the coach. Thank you very much. Then the coachman flicked his whip and the horses galloped into the starry night. Meanwhile, on the steps of the palace, the prince was bored. So many coaches, so many princesses, so many people to greet. Then another coach pulled up and out stepped Cinderella. Who is she? He asked, for he had never seen anyone so lovely. But no one could tell him. No one knew who she was, not even her stepsisters. The stepsisters did not recognize Cinderella, even when they got close, but they did feel jealous. Why does the prince not looking at us? They cried. 
for the prince looked only at Cinderella. Why does he not dance with us? They cried. When the prince asked Cinderella to dance again and again, for he had fallen in love with her. As for Cinderella, she could hardly believe what was happening. A handsome prince was dancing with her. She was so happy that she forgot the fairy godmother's warning. Even when the clock started to strike midnight, one, two, three, she danced on. Four, five, six, she danced on. Seven, eight, nine. Suddenly, she remembered and began to run toward the door. Come back, come back! Called the prince. But Cinderella kept on running. Ten, she reached the door and ran down the steps as fast as she could. One of her slippers fell off, but still she kept running. Eleven, come back, come back! She heard the prince calling as she looked around wildly. Twelve, where are my coach and horses? She cried. Sadly, she began to walk home, back to the kitchen. I will never see the prince again. She sighed. Meanwhile, the prince was determined to find the beautiful princess with whom he had fallen in love. Tomorrow, I will search every house in the land until I find the owner of this glass slipper. He cried. Then I will marry her. Early next day, he set off with his page to begin the search. It was evening when they came to the house where Cinderella lived. The stepsisters were waiting. Me first! Screamed one. No, me! Cried the other. First one, then the other tried to get her foot into the slipper. Sorry, said the page. Yours is too wide, and yours is too long. Does anyone else live here? Me, said Cinderella, who had come in quietly. Could I try? You laughed the stepsisters. Get back to the kitchen, but they were too late. The page put the slipper on Cinderella's foot, and it was a perfect fit. The prince was gazing at her, full of love. Will you marry me? He said, "Yes," said Cinderella, who could see that he loved her even in rags. The prince was as kind as he was handsome. Cinderella was as happy as she ever thought she could be. So they were married and lived together till the end of their days in perfect harmony. Aladdin. Far away in the land, the swallows fly to in winter. Lived a poor widow and her son Aladdin. They worked hard and owned little, but Aladdin had big dreams of gold and rubies and diamonds. One day, a strange man came to the house. Claiming he was Aladdin's uncle, I can make you rich," he said, with a glint in his eye. "If you will help me find my lamp." "Rich?" asked Aladdin. His eyes sparkling like jewels. He took Aladdin into the desert. They rode for days. Finally, they arrived at the trapdoor. Finally, they arrived at a trapdoor in some rocks, and he sent Aladdin through it into a cave. Frightened, Aladdin crept through the dark until he found the lamp. Aladdin asked his uncle to help him out. "Hand me the lamp first, boy," his uncle said. But Aladdin was scared in the darkness and begged, "No, please help me, uncle." 
His uncle became angry, and in his rage, he threw magic dust over the trap door and sealed it up. Aladdin was alone in the cold, dark cave. He looked at the lamp and began to cry. Big shining tears fell onto the lamp. Aladdin wiped the tears from the lamp, and suddenly a genie appeared. You have three wishes, he said. What is your first wish, O、oh、master? I wish to go home, said Aladdin. In the blink of an eye, Aladdin found himself in his kitchen. He told his mother of his mean uncle, the trapdoor, and the cave. That man is not your uncle, she said. He is a wicked sorcerer. Aladdin showed his mother the lamp. When he rubbed it, the genie appeared again. What is your second wish, O、oh、master? Asked the genie. I wish to be rich, said Aladdin. In the blink of an eye, a chest of treasure appeared. Aladdin and his mother bought the new house near to the palace, where they lived happily for many years. They forgot all about wicked sorcerer. In the palace. Lived Princess Yasmin. She was kind and clever, and as beautiful as the desert sunrise. Aladdin had grown into a handsome young man. He was strong and patient, and good to his mother. Aladdin had liked the princess from afar for a long time. One day they met in the palace gardens. And fell in love. They talked about days about how the world was round, and why camels slept standing up. Soon they were married, and the whole of the kingdom came to celebrate. But one man in the crowd was not smiling. It was the wicked sorcerer who wanted Yasmin for himself. He became angry at Aladdin once again. This is all because Aladdin has my lamp, he said to himself. I must get it back. The wicked sorcerer thought long and hard until he came up with a wicked plan. He bought himself hundreds of lamps and dressed as a lamp seller. When Aladdin was away traveling with his mother, the sorcerer walked past the palace, calling "New lamps for old, new lamps for old." Princess Yasmin knew nothing of the genie in the lamp. When she heard the lamp seller, she thought, "I will swap that dirty old lamp for a shiny new one. Aladdin will be pleased." As soon as he had the lamp in his hands. The wicked sorcerer rubbed it, and the genie appeared. "What is your wish, O、oh、master?" he said. The sorcerer smiled. "Take us far away," he said, "where Aladdin will never find us." The genie did as he had been asked, and flew the wicked sorcerer and Princess Yasmin to a land far, far away. When Aladdin got home. And found Princess Yasmin and the lamp gone. He knew the sorcerer had taken them. He bowed to search without stopping, until he found his precious Yasmin. Aladdin searched the whole of the city, but he did not find the princess. Then he searched the whole of the kingdom, yet still he did not find the princess. Aladdin. Did not give up easily. He set off to search another kingdom, where the sun was hotter, and the days longer, and the nights darker than oil. Aladdin searched far and wide, and high and low. He searched for a year and a day. Still, he did not find the princess. Then, early one morning. He came across a house in the desert. Thirsty, 
he knocked on the door for a glass of water. To his surprise, Princess Yasmin answered. Aladdin was overjoyed. Luckily, the sorcerer was asleep, so the princess told Aladdin of the wicked sorcerer and the genie in the lamp, and how he had wished them far, far away. She told him of the sorcerer's many magic powders. They could lock any door, turn mice into tigers, make men grow into giants. Or shrink until they disappeared. The sorcerer was still asleep. Aladdin quickly searched for the shrinking powder, and when he found it, he told the princess to put it in the sorcerer's tea. Then he hid. When the sorcerer woke up, he drank his tea, and instantly began to shrink. He grew as small as a mouse. Then as small as a pin, then he disappeared altogether in a little puff of smoke. Aladdin rubbed his lamp again, and the genie appeared. "What is your third wish, O master?" he asked. "Please take us home," said Aladdin. In the blink of an eye, Aladdin and the princess found themselves back at home. There they lived happily ever after.